Welcome to JS for Justice. I am your host, Ray. Subscribe if you are new here, hit that like button, and let us know your thoughts and theories on this case in the comment section below. Angela Marie Hammond was born on February 9th, 1971 in Kansas City, Missouri to Marsha and Chris Hammond. Those close to her called her Angie. To many, she was sweet, intelligent, and full of life. She was very energetic and could light up a room with her personality and smile. At four years of age, the Hammond family decided to move an hour and 15 minutes southeast to a little town called Clinton. Clinton was a farming community, but everyone pretty much knew each other. Shortly after the move, the family welcomed a baby boy. Angie was so excited to be a big sister. A little over a year later, her parents divorced, but they remained civil and made sure the kids had a loving and stable childhood. After graduating high school, Angie worked at Citizens Union Bank, which is now called Hawthorne Bank. She worked as a night processor. She also took some classes at Central Missouri State University in Warrensburg, but eventually she disenrolled. In November of 1990, 19-year-old Angie met and fell in love with 18-year-old Rob Schaefer, who was a star athlete in high school and had aspirations of joining the military. In January of 1991, the couple found out they were pregnant. Ecstatic about starting a family, Rob and Angie became engaged. Their relationship flourished and they were excited for their future. Tragically, that would never come to be. On Thursday, April 4th, 1991, Angie, Rob, and Angie's best friend Kyla attended a family barbecue at Angie's mother's house in Montrose. A little after 9 p.m., the trio went back to Clinton so Rob could babysit his younger brother. They got to the house around 10 p.m. They planned on meeting up after Rob was done babysitting. After dropping Rob off, Angie and Kyla cruised around town and caught up with each other. Around 11.15 p.m., Angie called Rob from a payphone at the Food Barn supermarket, which was about seven blocks from where Rob was at. Since Angie did not have a home phone, she wanted to let him know she had a great night but was exhausted and was going to head home and soak in a hot bath. The couple spoke for about 30 minutes. During the conversation, Angie alerted Rob of a suspicious man circling the block in an older model two-tone Ford pickup truck. She told him the truck was green with a white top and that there was a mural on the back window of the truck of a fish jumping out of water. The couple continued their conversation for a few short minutes until the suspicious man parked the vehicle next to the payphones. The man exited the truck and went inside the empty payphone booth next to Angie. Angie described the filthy bearded man to Rob, stating he was wearing dirty overalls and glasses. The suspicious man left the payphone booth and went back to his truck, grabbed the flashlight, and acted like he was looking for something in or around the vehicle. Angie asked the man if he needed to use the phone she was on, wondering if the phone was broken next to her. The man said no and that he was going to try again later. Rob volunteered to come down to the payphones, but Angie said no and that she was going to eventually head home. Moments later, Rob heard a blood-curdling scream, a man saying I didn't need to use the phone anyway, and the phone line going dead. Panicked, Rob dropped the phone, rushed to his car, and drove towards the location. Close to the location of the payphones, Rob recognized the pickup truck going the opposite direction of him at a high rate of speed. When the truck passed him, he heard Angie scream his name. He quickly threw his car into reverse and pursued the truck for about two miles. Eventually, the pickup truck made a sharp right turn on West Culvert Drive. And as Rob attempted to turn down the same road, his car stalled out. Unknowingly, Rob damaged the transmission of his car when he threw it into reverse to turn around. He got out of his vehicle and watched the taillights of the truck diminish into the dark. Rob went to the police station shortly after midnight and told the police every detail he could remember. He shared with them the man was driving a late 60s or early 70s green two-tone Ford F-150 with a white top. The truck also had minor damage to the left side front fender. Rob also described the truck having the fishing scene on the rear window and that the truck's license plates may have the letters XY on it. He also described the driver being a white male between 20 and 35 years of age, medium built, and had dark collar length hair. He stated the man was wearing dirty overalls, a dark colored baseball hat, eyeglasses, and he had a full beard with a mustache. Horrified and in shock of learning about Angie's abduction, the community rallied together, plastering missing poster signs of Angie all over town. 
Hundreds of volunteers and policemen conducted a massive air and land search in hopes of finding her or any signs of her. They combed through the woods, fields, and creek beds. Sadly, nothing turned up. In the beginning, law enforcement was skeptical of Rob and his story, claiming it seemed a little too convenient. They also couldn't find any witnesses to corroborate his story. Rob passed a polygraph test, and during the investigation, they learned Rob's car did have extensive damage to the transmission, which lined up to the story he had given police. He was cleared within a week of the investigation. The information on the pickup truck was ran through a database from Clinton, neighboring counties, and Missouri State Highway Patrol. Around 1,600 potential registered pickup trucks populated. However, police were not able to connect any of them to Angie's case. Two days after they cleared Rob, police claimed they had made a connection to Angie's abduction to two other unsolved cases within a 100-mile radius of Clinton. One of the cases included 42-year-old Trudy Darby, who was nearing the end of her night shift at the K&D convenience store in Max Creek on January 19, 1991. Around 10 p.m. that night, she noticed two strange men lingering around the front entrance of the store. She called her son and asked him to come down there. About 15 minutes later, her son arrived to the store, discovering his mother was nowhere to be found. Two days later, her body was discovered 12 miles south near the Little Nyawanga River. She had been raped and shot in the head twice. The other case happened on February 27th that same year. 30-year-old wife and mother of two, Cheryl Ann Kenny, was last seen working the night shift at the Quality Convenience Store in Nevada. Business was slow that night, so she decided to close up shop early. The store was found locked, and her white Chevrolet was discovered in the parking lot, indicating she had more than likely been abducted before getting into her car. Her time card showed she had clocked out at 10 p.m. and set the store's security alarms around 10.17 p.m. She has not been seen since. In 1994, two half-brothers, Jess Rush and Marvin Cheney, were arrested and charged for the abduction, rape, and murder of Trudy Darby after Jess had confessed and bragged to his friends about what he and his brother had done to her. While incarcerated, he confessed to other inmates about other rapes and murders him and his brother had committed throughout the years. He mentioned dumping bodies of two other women in remote locations. Marvin Cheney denied being involved with his brother in any of these crimes. His wife was his alibi on the night Trudy was murdered. However, she eventually recanted her statement, claiming she lied to law enforcement because she was afraid of him. Marvin Cheney pled guilty to the murder and kidnapping of Darby. Both brothers were served life sentences. In 2017, Marvin Cheney died in prison and was never charged in any other cases aside from Darby's. To this day, law enforcement believes the brothers might be connected to Angela and Cheryl's cases. Many people have speculated of other potential suspects, though, throughout the years. One potential suspect, who is serving a life sentence on a federal kidnapping charge, is a man named Larry Dwayne Hall. He was a Civil War reenactor who traveled to many states including Missouri, Illinois, and his home state of Indiana around the time of the disappearances. While he's never been charged with murder, it's been suggested he could be connected to the infamous Springfield 3 case. When pressed during an interview, Hall commented on five women he murdered, claiming three were from Springfield and two others were from small towns, but he couldn't remember the names of the towns. One contradiction to Hall being a suspect in Angie's case is that he drove a van and not a pickup truck. However, many people have argued that he could have borrowed or could have stolen the truck. Another person many people have suspected over the years is a man named Kenneth McDuff, who was convicted of murdering three teenagers in the 60s in Everman, Texas. He was given three death sentences that were eventually reduced to life in imprisonment. In 1989, he was paroled, and from 1991 to 1992, he went on to kill five more people. An accomplice to one of his murders, he confessed to police and a warrant was issued for McDuff's arrest. He was eventually caught in Kansas City, Missouri under a fake name and was executed in 1998. The reason why many people believe McDuff could possibly be a suspect in Angie's case is because he was living in Kansas City, Missouri at the time she was abducted. Another person people have suspected over the years is a man named Tommy Lynn Sells, who was nicknamed the Coast to Coast Killer because he hitchhiked across the country, sometimes picking up odd jobs. 
Sells was convicted for one murder, but authorities believe he may have committed a total of 22 murders around the United States. He did work in Missouri for a short period of time, and police believe he is linked to another cold case in Springfield. While these potential suspects do share some similarities regarding Angie's case, no arrests have ever been made. Through the years, there have been many reported sightings of Angie that sadly lead to nowhere. Friends and family have never given up on finding out what happened to Angie or where she could be. Her mother went on Oprah to share her story, and in 1992, Unsolved Mysteries featured Angie's case in a segment in hopes of someone coming forward. At the time of Angie's disappearance, she was 4'11", and weighed about 120 to 140 pounds. Keep in mind, she was four months pregnant. She's described as having red hair, brown eyes, and a scar on her upper lip. Angie would be turning 50 this coming February, and if not found, this coming April 4th, 2021, will mark 30 years since she was last seen by her family and friends. If you have any information on Angela Marie Hammond's case, no matter how small it is, please call the Clinton Police Department at 660-885-2679.